Welcome to Harder Poland. We are going to find out what a Brit in Poland thinks, but not just some typical British English teacher, some loser like me, a real honcho, the political counselor at the British Embassy in Warsaw, Poland, Crispin Wilson. Hello, Crispin. Hi, nice to be here. What does a political counselor do on a day-to-day -day basis? Right. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of slightly fancy term, but basically <laughs> a political counselor is in charge of understanding what's going on in Poland, why it's going on, and then understanding what the British government wants to do with Poland and trying to make those two things kind of work together. So it's kind of having that really close relationship with the with the Polish government on a kind of what we sort of call a strategic level. So the things that really matter for sort of global issues, understanding where Poland is coming from, where we're coming from and trying yeah. to find ways of making it work together. Now, I should declare an interest, which is I used to work at the British Embassy in Warsaw, but Crispy and I will be ruthless with you to demonstrate my journalistic <laughs> integrity. Now, you've been in Poland for how long? Uh, just coming up to a year now. Coming up to a year. Yeah. What were you expecting to find when you came over and when you were surprised by? Because, you know, let's be honest, yeah. Poland doesn't have the best PR, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. So I, I've got a bit of background in Poland. Um, uh, so in fact, my grandparents on one side were uh, were Polish. Um, no way. And they, they came over during, they actually left Poland during the war, um, but they were both Warsawians. So oh. um, they left at the very beginning of the war. Um, uh, my grandfather was a Polish officer um, and was offered the chance to, to, to leave the country. They went to Paris first um, and worked for the government in exile there. And then they moved to the UK. Their plan was to go on to Canada, but they never made it. They stayed in the UK. Uh, my mum was born there. Um, and so... And, and did you know them personally? I, I knew my grandmother. She only died about uh, probably 12 years ago. I didn't know my grandfather. He died when I was, you know, just a baby. So, um, so yeah, my grandmother was a big influence in my life. Um, I think perhaps unlike some British, Polish um, uh, communities or, or families, we didn't emphasize our Polishness a lot. Um, yeah. my, gran my grandparents were assimilators, yeah. and so they really tried to um, sort of uh, uh, fit in with the, with the British way of doing things, and they changed their, their name from Kiliszek to Kilna, for example. Um, so I always grew up with an understanding that I was half Polish, um, and that that was an important part of my heritage, but that it wasn't a kind of dominant part, and we didn't really have any family in Poland. Um, uh, so after the war, unfortunately, um, we lost a lot of family during the war and, and my grandparents decided never to return. So um, really, I only started reconnecting with my sort of Polish side of my of my life um, when uh, when I was a student. I came and taught English for a month in Poland. Awesome. Um, 2004 in Kalisz. Ooh. Um, so let's talk about the difference now between Poland yeah. 2004 and Poland 2022. Yeah. What's the big difference? I mean, I think, I think it's how global Poland is now. I think that is the big thing that I would say. In, you know, I first visited Poland in 1998, and then 2004, and then maybe once in 2010 for a wedding. But apart, every time I've seen Poland move more and more to being a kind of particularly Warsaw, a real global cap capital, um, you know, and how it really has become this kind of European powerhouse. And I think that's kind of the dynamism, I think, is what I would really pick up. Um, and something that I think is, is not really well understood outside Poland. Um, now, Crispin, you said you've been to a Polish wedding in 2010. So have you got any advice for any British people who might go to a Polish wedding? There's been a lot of those British Polish weddings over yeah, the last few years. Yeah. They can be quite dangerous. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's a really interesting question. So, so as a, uh, I think the key things uh, are, firstly, that you should um, expect to be there a long time. Um, so uh, they uh, traditionally go on from sort of, you know, afternoon with the service and if it's maybe a church service and then you've got the evening reception goes on until the next day. So you should be prepared to be there all night. <laughs> you will be very well fed. You will be very well uh, watered. If, and if you <laughs> like a drink, then that shouldn't be a problem mostly. Um, probably worth maybe trying to get uh, to look at some Polish folk songs beforehand. You know, there are some classics that are normally brought out. Um, so uh, yeah, there are a few things on YouTube about that as well. But uh, yes. uh, having learned when I was a student and teaching English, things like uh, uh, hey, Sokoły, you know, being able to bring that out was, you know, really worked That's well. That's a power so move at a British party. It, it, was it, was it a British party? It was, yeah. Just it was, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Did anyone uh, maybe imbibe a little bit too much vodka and not quite understand how to drink the stuff? Y yeah, I think, I mean, 
I think Ed, mo both sides were pretty skilled when it came to the drinking. <laughs> but uh, I think I think being faced with a bottle of vodka each, I think even for a for a Brit, you know, used to kind of maybe, you know, an open bar at a wedding, it's a different <laughs> level, really, you know. I can confirm, having been to two British Polish weddings, <laughs> it was chaos, and one of them was mine, and uh, yeah, yeah, the less said about that, the better. So coming back to your Polish route, so yeah. when you got assigned to come to the embassy, yeah. you must have been cock-a-hoop, you must have been absolutely delighted, because you kind of... It's, it must be emotional. You're kind of coming home in a way, right? You're completing the Odyssey. Yeah, I think so. So I think I think it was. So I had the choice. Uh, you know, in in the foreign of, in the what was the foreign office when I applied for it? It's now FCDO. Um, I applied for the role, um, and so I chose it. But there was a, one of, a good reason for that was being able to go back to Poland, and I never learned Polish as a child. So um, actually, it's a chance to learn Polish for the first time. Um, so, you know, my mum spoke a bit of it, but third generation, it doesn't normally get passed on. Yeah. So, and Polish isn't something you can easily pick up. So, um, as you do. <laughs> so I was lucky to get a year's worth of language training. I think that's been really important. But yeah, I'm the first member of my family to live in Warsaw since December 1939. So I think that's kind of a, a really interesting way of doing it. And coming back as a Brit, as a British diplomat is, yeah, it was a sort of great opportunity and one that I, I couldn't really pass up. So if I was coming to Poland, if I was a friend of yours, uh, which I obviously am now that we spent yeah, 10 yeah, minutes together yeah, today, yeah, yeah. Um, where would you recommend I go first? Where's the best place to go in Poland? Gosh, well, that's a good question. God, I mean, I think you've got to start in Warsaw. I do think so. I mean, you know, there's obviously the Warsaw crack. You feel the crack of people. Yeah. Just, like, I, I just so, go, so go. I think I think as a grandparent, as having had two grandparents who are Warsawians, I you've got my, to really. My, yeah. my heart is in Warsaw. I think because I think it tells you so much about Poland's recent history. Obviously, Krakow, you have the, the history, you have the, you know, the, the kind of, the history stretching back for hundreds of years. You get that a bit in Warsaw, but what in Warsaw you really get a sense of is what Poland's journey has been through the 20th century, I think. You know, everything from the, the independence period, you, you have obviously the Second World War and you can go and see all the museums that tell you everything you would ever want to know, probably more than you would ever want to know about um, what happened in Warsaw. And then, you know, you're reminded about the communist period through the Palace of Culture or through some of the museums. And then you, you can see what Warsaw is now. Everything that you would want to do in Warsaw, you can do pretty much. Um, you know, every type of food, every type of experience. If you want to go, I don't know, trampolining, or you want to eat Mexican food, or you want to go to a space exhibition, or a anything like that, you can do those all in Warsaw. And I think that's kind of that's kind of cool. Um, and then I guess the other thing is to say to go to the nat go to nature somewhere in Poland. So you know, do you get to travel around the country a lot? Do you have to glad hand and uh, you know sign booklets and things? So I haven't done as much of that as I'd have liked in the last year. I have to say um, I'm hoping to do more. The pandemic kind of made it hard at the beginning, and then we had the Ukraine crisis, um, which meant my travel in Poland was mainly down to the border and um, you know some really important work. But it, it you know it wasn't for fun, and obviously. Um, but I, I have managed to get down to the Bieszczady, um, which is kind of in the far southeast of Poland. Beautiful um, mountains. Yeah, really beautiful. For those who are sort of British, um, they might, it's a bit like the Lake District. There's some, it reminded me in places, but yeah, very beautiful. But you can go to the lakes, you can go to the Tatra Mountains, you can go to the sea. I think that's the great thing about Poland is whatever you like. If you like lakes or forests, you've got those. If you have got the, want the seaside, you've got that. If you want the mountains, you've got that. So Yeah, it yeah. is. it's a little bit of everything. It's like it's like yeah. a buffet for, for tourism, right? Yeah, Perfect exactly. for the two days. Now, let's talk a little bit about um, Ukraine. So obviously, Poland's played an absolutely integral role yeah. in the support for Ukraine. It's been a, a global leader, but as has the UK. So can you give us a little uh, kind of summary of the UK-Polish cooperation when it comes to to uh, supporting the Ukrainian people in yeah. their fight for uh, territorial sovereignty. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's been an absolute, absolutely crucial relationship. And I think you know, even before the the war, um, the UK had recognised Poland's strategic position. Um, and you know, particularly when it came to security, we we're already working really closely. We've got. Uh, 
um, about we had about 150 troops up in the north um, um, near the border with Kaliningrad, which is obviously a part of Russia, um, uh, as part of a NATO group. Um, we then sent more troops to support Poland when it was facing this sort of hybrid threat from Belarus, where they were using migrants as a as a kind of tool to sort of cynically put pressure on the Polish government. So we then. We then um, supported through that. And then obviously, as the threat from Ukraine um, increased, um, we've been coordinating even more closely. You know, we've had prime minister here twice um, in the last few months. Um, we've now got about 700 British troops um, uh, based in, in Poland, um, and they're doing you know, all kinds of things, including um, supporting Poland's um, security on the eastern flank of NATO. So, so I think that's really important, but it's not just about the kind of military support. We've obviously been working really closely on humanitarian as well. So, um, you know, uh, a lot of the humanitarian support that um, is provided is goes through Poland. You know, Poland has been a huge hub for both humanitarian support and military support. So um, we've been working really closely with the Polish government to get humanitarian aid in, particularly medical aid in through Poland. And then also, um, you know, we want to work more closely with Poland in terms of supporting their activities within within Poland in terms of support for the for the Ukrainian um, uh, refugees that are here and for those that are actually in po in in Ukraine as so, well. So let's talk about that then. It's millions of people came yeah. into Poland. Were you surprised by just how quickly they all seemed to just go into someone's random house yeah. and become part of the part of the scenery? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it was an amazing thing to watch, um, and uh, I think that uh, there was a huge amount of generosity shown. Um, at all levels in Polish society. This wasn't about the government deciding something w would happen and then, you know, no one else supporting it. Everyone supported it. And, you know, it was a grassroots initiative. Um, you know, people just got in their cars and went to the border to try and help. And having visited the border a few times, I mean, I couldn't believe it when I arrived and I saw the the kind of the welcome that people got. I mean, literally the moment they stepped across the border, there was hot food, there was there was clothes for the children, there was everything that the kids could need and then there were buses and would be straight to a reception centre where they would be given support to move on wherever they wanted to in Poland. And remember that Already before the war, there was a large Ukrainian diaspora in Poland, so a lot of people able to support their relatives. But I think you know, it's gone far beyond that. You yeah. know, um, and um, do you think do you think PR uh, the PR thing that Poland's that like, it hasn't been good enough? Because you know this and mm. I know this, just how amazing it was. But yeah. I feel like it kind of went under the radar a bit, and Poland didn't mm. do a good enough PR job. Do, would you agree with that assessment? I don't, I don't think it's that Poland necessarily didn't do a good PR job. I think it's I think it's it was just highlighting because in some ways, perhaps because it was so um, smooth, um, there were no refugee camps. There were no places to to film people. Um, uh, you know, people arrived were were received and then found their ways, as you say, into um, accommodation. So there wasn't this kind of um, media opportunity, really, perhaps. Um, but I think that, um, you know, the numbers are, are astonishing. You know, when we think that perhaps four million Ukrainians have passed through Poland uh, over the last few months, um, how exactly that's been managed has been amazing. So yeah, perhaps it almost Poland, Poland's success meant that it didn't get the attention that it otherwise would have got. W were people contacting you from the UK saying, what's going on there? Because there's no camps, there's no, it doesn't make sense. I, people were contacting, but mainly because they wanted to help. So a lot yeah. of people wanted to know how to help how to support refugees. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest in our relocation scheme um, for, you know, the the, uh, the Ukraine family scheme and other things, but also just how can we help in Poland? So I think it was really helpful that the Polish government recognised that quite quickly and set up websites and other things to say, yeah. you know, this is how you can help. Now, coming back to the British presence in Poland, I'll tell you one piece of uh, unfriendly and kind of hateful comments I get, mm. which is, oh, you British people, you betrayed us in 39. Mm. And OK, we, mm. we can talk about that, with the, you know, not without reason. You, the, you'll do it again, you know. And mm. I say to them, come on, guys, this, mm. this, uh, you said 700 British troops mm. in Poland. Mm. That wasn't the case in 1939. Mm. Don't be so naive. Mm. You're, a me you're a member of NATO. Is that, is that naive or are they being cynical or are they being a bit more realistic? 
I mean, I understand where they're coming from, and I think if I was in Poland's position, I would, uh, I would certainly always, always remember my history and remember what happened. And you know, but equally, I do think the context has changed now. NATO is a different alliance, you know, compared to the alliances of 1939, which was sort of bilateral. NATO is a huge multinational, multilateral organization, and it's not it's not down to one country to decide there is a treaty and you know article 5 is very well understood that you know defense of one country is defense of all and you know i think it's the Amer it's it's not just about us it's about the commitments the americans have made and all the other nato countries so yeah i i think i think poland is understandably very concerned for its security and i think you know history has shown that you know, Poland needs to, you know, needs to invest in its own security, and it's doing that. You know, there's a new, there's a new um, national defence law, um, which is, you know, going to spend. They're going to spend three percent of their GDP on, on defence. They're investing a huge amount in different new systems, and and so I think, you know, Poland's taking its own security seriously, but we're also taking it seriously as well. So, um, and you know, the pri prime minister when he came, comes here always wants to to talk to British troops and to sort of emphasize that part. So yeah, I think it's, I think it is different now. Um, Let's go on to a slightly lighter hearted question. Uh, Crispian, if you were locked in a prison cell with any Polish person living or dead, bearing oh in mind gosh. you'd be in the prison cell for quite a long time for crimes committed against uh, uh, something, um, who would that be? You're gonna be there a long time. <sighs> gosh, I mean, that's such a difficult question. May, I mean, you know, you, you've got some of the, the greats. I think, you know, Copernicus, I, I've got, I'm a scientist by background, so, you know, ah. probably, you know, someone like Copernicus would be, would be up there. But I think also, you know, some of the poets and Up on the top artists, bank or in the well, I don't know, I, who knows, who knows. Yeah, he can go and maybe, I'll get him, to, he can look out the window he at the, the, the stars or whatever. Stars, yeah. But, you know, um, some of the Polish poets as well, you know, even up to today, um, uh, I think it would be, would be great, uh, you know, um, great, great kind of uh, uh, cellmate. So, uh, you know, um, Szymborska or something like that, you know. That's a good choice. She, I, I, think, I think she would probably be pretty good because she, she wrote about the kind, of, uh, the kind of everyday and finding joy in the everyday. And I think if you were in a prison cell, you'd probably need that. Maybe both of them, maybe can I both I, of I'm them? gonna give you a, th a three person cell oh with you included so you me. can have Copernicus and yeah. Szymborska. Yeah. What's your favorite Polish word? <sighs> oh. So, so my mum, although she didn't teach me much, much Polish, did teach me Polish tongue twisters. Ah. So I like that I can still say "change oh, brzmi which good. is good. Which is good. He's good. But um, um, I, I think I think I, yeah, I think that would be kind of that would be kind of up there. But I, you put me on the spot because I, there are so many ones that I really that I really love. Um, Do you find yourself playing with a Polish word and just definitely, using it a definitely, lot? definitely? But I was going to say, you know, I think probably the one that. It's not so much to say, but I, but I think really kind of in, in, encompasses the Polish spirit is this whole, you know, the idea of kombinovac, which is, <laughs> you know. Can you explain that for our viewers? So I think, I guess I translate it as finding a way through something, kind of working your way through a problem. Um, and I think that's what I was going to say about the way that the Poles have dealt with the Ukrainian um, uh, uh, refugee issue is that they've 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 not really waited for anyone else to sort things out. They've said both as government and at a societal level, we're going to do this ourselves and we're going to work our way through. And that's really Kombinovac. Um, so that's yeah. a, that's a fantastic word and a fantastic moment to close our Heart of Poland program down. Crispin Wilson, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure discovering your Heart of Poland. And if you've enjoyed this interview with Crispin, well, I've got good news for you. You can find well over 100 fascinating conversations with fascinating people leading fascinating lives in the fascinating country of Poland. All you have to do is visit the firstnews.com the premier English language uh, web service about Poland. And you can also visit the firstnews.com on social media. And there you'll find Heart of Poland and a whole bunch of other programs about the fascinating country of Poland. So I'll see you again for another episode of Heart of Poland. <laughs>